Hello. Uh, I'm going to be talking about Little Living Places. Uh, I've been working in games for about nine years now, uh, working on various different things from like shooters and racing games. But I recently moved down and joined Us Two Games in London, which is really exciting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> People, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I want to talk about what makes a place feel alive, like uh, a place that lives on in your memory, like after you've finished playing it, or maybe even while you're playing it, you think about it, and it makes it feel real, and like it could be a place that you could visit one day. And I really love this. It's one of my favorite things th to find in a game, and it kind of it really excites me. And I want to kind of see whether in the design we can kind of find something whether that that is key to that that we can kind of reproduce or kind of understand why it feels alive. Um, I want to start off by talking about Neko Atsume, which is, how many people have played Neko Atsume? <laughs> Yay! Um, it was one of my favorite games from a couple of years ago. It's a game about collecting cats. Um, and it first came out in Japanese, and you could download it, and just, it was all in Japanese, but you could find guides really easily to kind of teach you how to play it. And the basic idea was you put a piece of furniture down for the cat, and then nothing would happen, and you'd turn it off, and then you'd pick it up, and then the cat would have left you fish to buy more things for cats to come and give you more fish. And you, yeah, it's just, just a very simple game, but sometimes you can even spy them playing with the things or eating the food, and it was really exciting. And that was, that was all the game was, but it, I played it for a long time, and I had really great friend, like, fun talking to my friends about them playing it and the discoveries they made. And for such a simple game, it really felt alive. It felt like a little backyard that I could go check in and, and like, I was excited about like, what cat I'd see next. Um, so going back about other places that feel alive, this is probably my favorite video game and probably my favorite place in my favorite video game. It's the starting uh, village from Link's Awakening on the Game Boy. And again, it's a tiny little world in your pocket, but I think we all have somewhere in like an old game, one of the first like RPGs or adventure games that we played that's like this, a little town that you feel like, oh, I definitely went out on an adventure from then, and I came back and I was a changed person. Like, I'd been, I'd like, it, I view it through a different lens. So I wanna kind of compare the two things maybe and kind of talk about like the way you can do it in very old games and the, like, or very classic games where you have a character you move around and a game which is just about clicking and putting down items and watching what happens. Um, so the first thing with Link's Awakening is that uh, you come back here again and again and again throughout your adventure. I counted them up through like a couple of walkthroughs and found like nine times when you came back and something had changed in the village. A dog got stolen, a shrine opened, you had to go get an item, you had to go find your friend so she could sing to kind of send a, send a creature to sleep. Like you keep coming back and that's the kind of key thing. It's a place you come back to. You can't gain familiarity with a place until you come back there again and again, like in the Pokemon games, you constantly just run through a place and then you never come back to that town. Like you just leave it behind and they never have a chance to kind of feel real. Um, there are obviously exceptions and stuff, but, but I think that's the kind of fundamental thing. The, the first thing is you have to come back here again and again and Neko Etsume, the core thing is coming back and seeing this place again and again. So going on to kind of what else uh, feels alive, uh, Mountain was a game I really liked where you just watch it. You can't do anything. There's no interface whatsoever, apart from you can play some notes and it doesn't really seem to do anything. Um, but you check back in and things have changed. A dice, a giant dice has fallen or the seasons have changed or something like that. And um, there's no interaction, but things change over time without you. And I think that's, the other, that's another thing, a fundamental thing of having a life of its own. And that can be in multiple ways. It can be you like things changing because you didn't do anything or a system like The Sims that plays out on its own and you get to prod and poke it and see what happens next, or a game with a lot of backstory that you're kind of discovering the life that came before you walked into the room, like Gone Home. But I think this feels, Gone Home feels really naturalistic because when I was on holiday a couple of weeks ago, I went to an Airbnb and in an Airbnb, you're doing the same thing. You're like, you can't help it. You kind of start to see the things around. You see discarded Christmas presents that are left for you rather than for the people who live there. And you also see, this is my favorite one in Airbnb, the DVDs that are left for you. Like, what's this person's taste or what's this person's not taste anymore? And you kind of accidentally, but kind of a fun game of like constructing the backstory just like you do. And it makes it feel alive, because it is. It's a real person's house, but video games play on the same kind of idea of like, they trick you because they're things you naturally do. I think the next thing is quite, uh, are things that games 
try to do quite vocally all the time. Your actions are remembered. Oh, it's a Bioware game. You say things to people, and they say things back, and they remember that time you disagreed with them. And even taking it out of RPGs and kind of boiling it down to games like the Yorg, where it's no fighting, there's no running around a town, you're just making dialogue choices and, and going around. You kind of get used to that chain. It feels alive, but um, I think the moments when places really come alive are, again, Link's Awakening, um, you, you can do something that really surprises you. You're surprised that the game was listening to something you did. And in Link's Awakening, you can take an item uh, from the shop, go over to the shopkeeper, pay for it, and then walk out the door. But you can also run circles around him, and he turns just a bit slower than you run, and then you can run out the door, and you're like, oh, I got one over on the game. But the next time you go in the shop, <laughs> it's not a pretty sight. And it does, it zaps you, and then every character now calls you Thief in the game. Like, you're, like the characters you're really good friends with are like, hey, Thief, how's it going? Let's go on an adventure. And you're like, oh, what? Like, everyone knows. The shame. Um, so, yeah, the kind of the surprising ways in which games pay attention to what you're doing and just reflect it in little ways, I think, is really important to making it feel alive. And kind of going back through those and looking at Neko Atsume, you pick up on the things you're doing. It's a very simple game, but the game is responding to the items you put down and you look, it looks at them and it goes, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you this cat. This cat's interested in that. Um, but kind of taking a sidestep to a game, Mitomo. I was really excited about Mitomo. I think a lot of people were. It was like, oh, Nintendo is going to release this game, and I'm really excited. And I kind of was thinking about these things, and it didn't come to life in my head. And I think that's one of the fundamental reasons I didn't uh, kind of continue playing it. I was really excited for the first few days. I kept buying outfits, and I kept coming back to it. It felt like people were responding to my questions. And then I didn't know what to do next. I was like, what else is there? I'm just buying outfits. Um, and I think the really key thing for that is that there was no mystery. It was like a shop front, and you were talking to people, and it never felt alive because there was, you got to know the shop because the shop had a good interface, and you knew everything that was available, and you kind of knew the limits of what the game could give you. And from Neko Atsume, I was so excited when I saw this cat. I was like, I've seen ginger cats, I've seen white cats, I've seen black and white cats. And then I saw this cat with a hat, and I was so psyched. <laughs> I was like, he's got a little whistle, he's got a little hat, and it's like, oh, wow. I didn't even know this game had cats with hats in. But little did I know, I went online, there was this cat. I was like, <laughs> even in a really simple way, you can add mystery to a game in a way that makes it feel alive. When you don't know the extent to which it goes, you're kind of surprised and intrigued, and you push forward. Games have done these kind of really weird spaces where you don't really know what's going on and you're kind of discovering this dreamscape. Pleasure Drones of Kubla Khan was the Kubla Khan was the first one I ever encountered kind of free, like on a, I think it was pre-itchio, so you just found it on, on Game Jolt, I think. Um, and there are lots of games like this that are really interesting and I had great fun playing, but they didn't live on with me afterwards. They don't feel alive. But recently, Diaries of a Spaceport Janitor just come out. And I really enjoy this because it has the aesthetic of these really weird dreamscape games. But it gives you this really repetitive structure that you get to know. You, it's, it's like you go out, you find trash, you burn trash and sell trash to get money so you can survive the next day. But there are all these weird mysteries and weird characters who live there. Um, like at the beginning, it asks you, what god do you support? And it gives these really weird statues. And you're like, I don't. I don't know, um, but you have to pray to them, or you think you have to pray to them, because it's constantly prompting you whenever you see a statue. It's like, I guess I'm going to keep praying. And you're kind of discovering what the system is under the hood, and you don't know the extent of it, and I think that's kind of part of the key mystery of it. So this is kind of diversion number two, which is Firewatch. So in Firewatch, it's probably my favorite game this year. I really, really enjoyed it. Probably a lot of people feel the same, but this kind of has those key tenets as well. The, for example, Henry's house, it's a place you come back to. You, you can come back and it, things have changed because of things you didn't do, like people might have been there or the weather might have changed. Your actions are remembered. You can pick up things and put them in your house. Things you do, things you see start appearing around his house. Henry decorates his house because of his life. And it's also a game about mysteries. You're trying to work out what the hell's going on, what, what, what is Henry's story and what is your story. But Firewatch for me didn't live on after I kept playing it. I didn't think about that forest as a place that was real and a place that I would come back to on a holiday or something like that. But I think the reason for that is that the game is entirely about Henry. 
And I think even when you do a really, really good job of doing all these things, you've got to, at the end of the day, choose what your focus is. Is your focus on this world that you're exploring or is the focus on your character? And everything that happens in the game happens so that you can find out more about Henry and Henry can find out more about himself. And so, in a way, the world that feels alive, I came away with, was Henry. Henry feels like an alive character for the same reasons that the locations in these other games feel alive. And I think that can expand beyond games as well. I think it does expand beyond games. And there are places like, this is a really old GeoCities map of Hogwarts. I was really excited to find, like, I, when I was a kid, I tried to draw a map of Hogwarts, but you don't. You can't because there's so many mysteries around it. You know these key, like, core locations, you know, the common rooms and things like that, but you don't know how it all connects. There could always be another corridor or another place. And I think there's lots of examples, like, outside of games, like Twin Peaks, where like, you get to know the locations and the characters, but you never know what's around the corner, or Westeros. Where, and these inspire people to make these kind of fill in the gaps themselves with their own stories and their own minds, or share them. And this kind of brings me towards the end of it, which is I've been reading The Secret History of Twin Peaks, which is a really good, fun book. And the kind of crux of it is uh, my... Mark Frost, thank, I almost lost it. Mark Frost uh, wrote this book, and he's the, one of the lead writers on Twin Peaks. And he talks in it about the difference between secrets and mysteries. And he talks about secrets um, being a list of facts that are kept to yourself to kind of gain power over people. And in, I think in narrative, we all know those kind of cheap surprises that we've had where it's like, oh, it's just this fact I didn't know. They're just kind of pulling me along with these facts that I, I uh, as breadcrumbs for kind of finishing each season of Lost or whatever. And even though I really liked Lost, it did definitely feel like the mystery stopped being exciting things and just felt like a tick list of things that I learned about the world. But mysteries, he describes, as the idea of mythologies that live on in your memory that inspire you, and even if you know the answers, you, you ask more questions about them, and they kind of, they excite you and can never be fully explained. Um, and interestingly, I was listening to a podcast earlier this week, and Link's Awakening was mentioned, it was, it was a podcast retrospective of Link's Awakening, and they mentioned that the designers of Link's Awakening uh, designed the NPCs to remind them of Twin Peaks characters. They said that they wanted the characters to be suspicious. And I, didn't, I didn't know about this before writing this talk. I was really excited. I was like, oh, that's a good one. Um, but they said they, they, the work keyword was suspicious. So you get to know these characters in Link's Awakening, but they're suspicious. You never know what they're going to do or not do. Um, and I think that's the core thing for me is it's attention this is the real, like why places feel alive. It's attention between understanding a place, knowing a place, knowing the back streets or the kind of the shops or the shopkeepers but not not ever knowing how much you don't know and being able to keep that veil of mystery uh, about what what's the extent of these worlds and that's what makes it feel real yeah that's been me